we sent David Baker to Rwanda with an organization called Charity Water, which is rethinking what a nonprofit is. It's starting again with the fundamentals about how you don't just execute, but you create open communication. Please, can we welcome Scott, our first speaker. Morning, everybody. Oh, man. I uh, wasn't sure anybody was going to turn up this morning after uh, what I heard about the party last night. So I'm glad to see a few of you. Uh, I am going to uh, spend the next 25 minutes talking about uh, a little bit about my story and my, I guess, th the non traditional path uh, to get to, uh, to the nonprofit space. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my passion for water and the water crisis. Uh, and how I believe this can be completely solved. And then I'm going to talk about Charity Water in the last six years and uh, some stories from the organization. So a little bit about me. Uh, as a kid, this was my hair. My parents used to actually use a bowl to cut it, hence, uh, hence the bowl cut. And I was, I was a really good kid. And I kind of had this, oh, I have a little bit of a prodigal son story, as you're about to find out, but I grew up uh, taking care of a mom who was really sick. She was an invalid, and we grew up in the church, and I was like, I was just doing all the right things. I went to church and took care of my mom. And then at 18, like so many really bad cliches, I rebel, and I'm now going to look out for number one. And I moved to New York City, grew my hair down long to my shoulders, joined a band, and decided I was going to, you know, become a rock and roll star. That immediately did not work out. The band hated each other and we broke up. But I learned that you could actually fill up nightclubs full of people, get them drunk, and get paid for it. So this sounds like a great way to rebel in style. So for the next 10 years, that's exactly what I did. And here's a snapshot of my life at 28. Uh, I choose this photo because it shows what an idiot I am, holding out the Rolex watch so that the photographer photographs my Rolex watch. It was a little darker uh, if you ran into me you know, at 3 or 4 in the morning. And uh, you know, I was doing tons of cocaine, ecstasy, MDMA, gambling problem, pornography problem, you know, serious drinker. Total disaster, total mess. And uh, thankfully, after 10 years of, uh, of doing this, uh, I came to my senses in Punta del Este, South America. And I was with all of the beautiful people and like the BMW, the Rolex, you know, the girlfriend who was on uh, magazine covers. And I realized, wow, I'm miserable. I'm the most selfish, sycophantic scumbag that I know. And I better make a change. So I started reading theology, hung over on this beach, and uh, sort of rediscovered my Christian faith in a different way as an adult. And, uh, you know, it wasn't shoved down my throat anymore. And I decided I'm going to try to make a huge change, do a 180 and go serve the poor for one year. I'm going to volunteer in Africa. Now, I start applying to humanitarian organizations thinking this is going to be easy, and I am denied by every single organization. They're like, what the heck is a nightclub promoter? You know, how would you be useful to us? Finally, one org said, um, we're going to a place called Liberia, and if you pay us $500 a month, you can volunteer. <laughs> I was like, I'm in. <laughs> Here's my credit card details. So I had convinced them that I should be their, their photojournalist. Uh, I put up a bunch of vacation pictures on a blog and uh, you know, I, some, some poems I've written. And I said, you know, I can share the images of what you guys are doing with all the people that I know in life uh, or through my nightlife. So I make this complete 180 degree turn and I join a hospital ship. And I'm going to be taking pictures of everything that happens on the ship. Amazing organization, 25 years they have sailed up and down the African coast, bringing doctors to the people uh, that, that needed access to free medical care. Liberia is a disaster. Right? I cannot take pictures without capturing bullet holes. People are living in bombed out buildings, bombed out houses. And before the ship sailed, the doctors put up all these flyers around the country. And they said, if you've got a huge tumor, if there's a piece of your face missing, if you've got a cleft lip or a cleft palate, turn up and maybe our doctors can help you for free. And I was going to be taking all of these pictures and I, I really wasn't prepared for what I saw. 7,000 people turned up for these 1,500 surgery slots. So that was a big, oh crap, moment. We're going to turn 5,000 people away. And some of these people had walked for a month just to get to the doctors. First kid in line, 5.30 in the morning, is Alfred. And um, 
this is what I was going to be doing for the next year. And I remember meeting him, having to take his picture, and just running in the corner like a baby crying. I lost it. I was like, take me back to the nightclubs. Get me out of this place. I can't handle it. The doctor said, we're going to be able to help Alfred. And by the way, this is what we've done for 25 years. I don't know how you missed that memo. Pull it together. Do your job and photograph these 1,000 patients. So I did. A couple days later, they invited me into Alfred's surgery, and I got to see these volunteer doctors take out this freaking tumor on his face. And then I got to take him home a couple weeks later and learn the, the magic that happened on this ship. And that story just repeated over and over again. I'd meet a woman like Martheline. Uh, this tumor grew for 10 years. 40-minute surgery. I just gave her a new face. Signed up for another year. Um, after meeting all of these extraordinary people. And on the second uh, tour there, I started learning about dirty water. I got my first taste of it. And there was one guy off to the side, even though this was a medical ship, who would go into the villages and he would help people get clean water. And I had to photograph his work too. And he showed me people were drinking from swamps and ponds and rivers. I remember just saying, like, bro, there's no way you're going to tell me people drink that. I wouldn't let my dog drink that water. And sure enough, it was all, of the, all that these rural communities had. So what he would do is work with the locals. And the irony is that right underneath the ground, there was clean water. So he would work with them. And he'd take me back. And he would show me the clean water for a few thousand dollars. And here these doctors were doing expensive surgeries. And I was photographing and getting to know the patients. But this guy off to the side was helping thousands of people get something so basic. I came back to New York City. You know, Everything in my life had changed. I mean, I'd quit gambling and smoking. and drugs and all that stuff. And I'd seen all these problems, but I kept coming back to the pond. No one should have to drink dirty water. I'd never had to drink dirty water my whole life. And I said, maybe I can spend the rest of my life trying to do something about it. And the idea for Charity Water was born. So I'm going to talk about what I found when I started learning about the water crisis and what I was going to do. I learned that 800 million people right now don't have clean water. Again, something I'd taken for granted, I bet Nobody in this room has ever had to actually drink from a pond or a river. But if you guys came with me, this is what you'd see. You'd see communities drinking out of algae. You'd see open wells shared by cows. You'd learn that up to 80% of the disease in the world is caused by bad water and a lack of toilets, lack of sanitation. Some of these diseases you've heard of, some you haven't. Schistosomiasis is particularly nasty. 300 million people right now have worms crawling around in their body toward their liver because of the water they drank. Leeches, probably something no one in this room has ever associated with drinking water. But community after community will show you the leeches in their open springs. And they say, you know, the big ones are never a problem. We always filter them out. But sometimes the little ones will get through our cloth, get through the filtration, and then they grow up and they like to stick to the back of our necks. Learn all the time being wasted as people go back and forth for dirty water. It's a tough story, but earlier this year in Ethiopia, I learned of a woman named Letikouros, and this actually isn't her. She lived before we started working there. But this is right near the region, and she was 25 years old, and she had a clay pot on her back. And you saw those yellow jerry cans. They actually are, are an improvement. They weigh nothing. When they drop, they bounce. She had a clay pot, and she walked eight hours a day, three out, five back, with about 60 pounds of water on her back. And this guy that, that knew her and knew about our work there said one day she came back into the village, she slipped and she fell, and the pot broke, and all the water that she'd fetched for eight hours spilled out. And he said she took the rope from the pot and she hung herself from a tree in the middle of his village. And he said, the work you guys are doing is important, and he walked off. Gave us a great sense of the urgency of the work. Right now, people are walking eight hours a day to get water that will make them sick. It's a solvable problem. We know how to solve this problem in its entirety. And if you're solution agnostic and you don't try and shove one solution down everyone's throat, there are lots of ways you can bring clean water. Hand dug wells, rainwater harvesting, pond sand filters, drilled wells, springs. For about 65 bucks in Cambodia, you can build a sand filter. And you take water like this in, and you turn it into water like that that you or I could drink. 10 grand, you can. Build a well, serve 300 people. It's just a lot of digging. Sometimes dynamite, jackhammers as you go down 40, 50 feet. It's months worth of work. 
15, 20 grand, you bring in a, a million dollar rig. And you go deeper, three, four, 500 feet, tapping into these massive underground aquifers, lakes underneath these villages. This is at a school with 1,500 kids. And then water changes everything. When you bring water into communities, it starts affecting the health. Kids get healthier. They stop dying of diarrhea. They get to spend more time in school because they're not walking four or five hours in the morning. Women will, will often tell us that sometimes they just use the extra time and they spend more time with their kids. But they'll often start small businesses. They'll earn a dollar or two dollars a day. This woman, Helen, actually told us she felt beautiful for the first time because she now finally had enough water to wash her face and her clothes and that of her kids and her husband. And she never had enough water and she always put her family first. And what I loved about it was just tangible, it was provable. You know, you could know that you'd actually made a difference. The water was there and it's flowing or it wasn't. The UN came out with a powerful 88-page report saying, not only does water make people healthier, it makes them really richer, 12 times richer on average. So if you want to lift people out of poverty, it's a great, great way to do it. So six years ago, I started Charity Water. Two big ideas. I wanted to end the water crisis, and I also wanted to reinvent charity, reinvent giving. My friends thought charity sucked. They weren't giving. They had all of these excuses. They said, you know, well, I give to a charity. My money goes into a black hole, into a void. Charities are inefficient and opaque. And I thought, well, they're, they're right in some cases, but I wasn't jaded at all. I thought maybe we just needed a new model and we could bring a lot of these disenchanted people back to the table and get them excited about giving. So we came up with a 100% model. Two bank accounts, they would never touch each other. 100% of the public's money would only directly fund water projects. And I had no idea how we would fund our staff and operations. I figured you know, maybe we could convince board members and sponsors and companies and uh, private donors. But we made this promise that we would never touch the public's money unless it went to projects. We would even pay back credit card fees. Someone gave 10 grand and we got 9,600 after Amex took their four points. We would separately raise the 400, send all $10,000. The second thing we would do is use technology just to show people where their money went. And this was so simple to me. Handheld GPS devices cost $99. Let's buy them, let's put them out in all of the countries where we're working and never fund a project unless we can be guaranteed it exists. And then make all of those photos and GPS public on Google Earth and Google Maps. So people would know where the money had gone, the impact. And the third thing was to build a brand. You know, Nick Kristoff had written in the New York Times that people were peddling toothpaste with more sophistication than all of the world's life-saving causes. I just thought that was broken. And you just needed good taste and a couple talented designers. And if we were going to solve this problem, we would need a brand that rivaled Nike or Apple. We would need an epic brand. So six years ago, I threw a party. It was the only thing I knew how to do to start this thing off. I gave my friends open bar. I told them they had to pay $20 at the, at the door, and 700 people came. We took the $15,000 that we raised to northern Uganda to a refugee camp. We built three wells. We fixed three wells. And then we sent those photos and GPS back to all the people that attended. We started launching creative ad campaigns. We said we don't always need to take ourselves so seriously. We can have a little bit of fun with the brand. Normally, we did take ourselves seriously and tried to bring you know, these statistics to life, these mind-numbing statistics. Right? How many of you can imagine 4,500 kids doing anything, let alone dying? But maybe giving your, your child you know, death in a baby bottle is a more resonant image. We got free media on buses, on taxis, and billboards, got into the product marketing space, created yellow charity, charity water items that raised awareness and also money. Stuff like dodo cases and playing cards. We partnered with brands in a creative way. Uh, this is one of my favorite. McAllen came to us and said, a lot of water in our whiskey, a lot of water in Scotland. We love what you're doing. <laughs> We're like, OK. <laughs> so they said, OK, we have it. We have a 64-year-old McAllen. It's the oldest we've ever made. What if we took it on a world tour? And to taste it, you had to drop $5,000. And we were like, who the heck would pay $5,000 for this much whiskey? And then they wrote us a $605,000 check. <laughs> Some guy paid $62,000 in Taipei. Uh, we love social media, so we were the first charity to get a million followers on Twitter. And we used Instagram, Facebook, sharing images, sharing videos. 
organization made over 300 videos. We tried to reinvent the gala. We were so bored of these rubber chicken you know, sit-down dinners. And just try to create a huge experience where 2,500 people would come in and create experiences like the water walk, where they would walk on a fashion show catwalk carrying 40 or 80 pounds of water, and companies would pay every time they walked. We got to open up the NASDAQ twice. We got to close the New York Stock Exchange just by asking to spread awareness. And then we stumbled onto this big idea, and the organization started to scale. On our one-year anniversary, we're going to do another party. And I thought, man, I just, I, I'm too old for the clubs. That was a pain. What if I gave up my birthday and asked everyone I knew to donate 32 bucks, my age in dollars? And I would go to Africa and I would drill a well via satellite so they could see where their money went. So I wasn't sure this would work, but I emailed a, you know, a war on all my friends and everybody I knew, and I wound up raising about 60 grand. And I said, wow, this is a big idea. Everybody could care about clean water. Everybody has a birthday. And they have one every year. So this seven-year-old kid, Max, in Austin, Texas, goes around and starts knocking on doors asking for seven bucks. And he raises $22,000. We're like, wow, big idea. Justin Bieber tweeted three times, raised $47,000 for his birthday. Jack Dorsey raised almost $200,000. I started spreading through technology. Daniel Eck raising $45,000. Will and Jada Smith started spreading through Hollywood where actors and their fans could give up birthdays. They actually got to come with us a couple months ago to see those projects. Most of the money was actually raised by people you'd never heard of. People like Maggie giving up her 16th birthday, no gifts, no party, using her birthday so that other people could have birthdays, raising five grand. And then it started uh, to, oh, Nona, probably my favorite, 89 years old. Didn't even raise $89, but she gave up her birthday anyway. <laughs> and she had a beautiful mission statement. She said, I'm turning 89. I want that to be possible for more people in Africa. People got it. People started climbing mountains, trying to raise a dollar a foot, jumping out of planes, stuff we never thought of, giving up weddings, giving up honeymoons. Imagine when someone sends you a $10,000 check and said, we gave up our wedding so a village could have clean water. People sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, four groups have walked across America. Riley ate rice and beans for a month. <laughs> and then Rachel Beckwith, one year ago, a little over a year ago. Some of you guys might have heard this story. It kind of swept around the world. She was nine, tried to raise 300 bucks for her ninth birthday. She fell short raising 220. And she told her mom, I'm so sorry. I wanted to help more kids. I'm going to do better next year. Right after her birthday, she was killed in a car crash. And her church community came around her. Her, uh, her town, Seattle, came around her. They started leaving $9 on her fundraising page after her death. The page went up to $100,000. And it went to $300,000. Then people in Africa started donating. People in India, people in Indonesia. She raised over $1.2 million. A couple months ago, I took her mom, her pastor, and her grandparents on the one-year anniversary of her death to see what she'd done and to meet some of the people that their daughter had helped. I'm going to play that short video for you guys. Morning, and we're about to go see some of Rachel's wells. I am 
Richard. I am Rachel's grandfather. I really wish Rachel could be here today because first of all, Rachel would think that this is probably the neatest thing she'd ever seen in her entire life. Our community, our church, where we are from, we greatly love Rachel and continue to love her family. And I'm overwhelmed with how greatly you have honored her memory. Uh, so please receive uh, my most deepest and heartfelt thanks. You've done us a great honor today, so thank you. Yeah. developed such a big heart from such a young age that she understood and felt the pain of others on the other side of the world. To give up her birthday present so that other children can improve their lives is the most beautiful gift a person can give. As you guys can imagine, that was a pretty heavy day. Uh, it was amazing how, to see how the Ethiopians had honored uh, Rachel. They named a whole valley after her. They named a park after her. They told their children about her. Uh, they brought gifts. The children had dread, uh, drawn um, photos of Rachel for the family. Um, it was pretty amazing. What it, what it taught us was what started out at Charity Waters, our story, is kind of a scrappy startup um, how hard we could work, you know, could we do 80, 90 hour weeks, it really wasn't about us. And it wasn't our story, it was their story. It was Max's story, it was Rachel's story, it was the 30,000 people that had given around the world, it was the 60,000 people getting helped. And if we were actually intentional about getting out of the way, maybe this thing could scale and maybe we could actually help 800 million people. If we gave people simple tools, if we were good stewards and then we showed them their impact. We created something called Dollars to Projects, which took every single dollar and with integrity it linked it to where it ended up, the photos and the GPS. So every single person that fundraises can see where their money went, the name of the village, how much that water project cost, pictures of the water project. They could see it on Google Earth, Google Maps. And every single donor gets an email saying, you gave $39 or $9 to Rachel's campaign. Click here to see exactly where it went. The rig that, that drilled Rachel's first well was crowdsourced. And last year, we got 12,000 people 
to give about $100 each to fund a $1.2 million drill fleet. And we wanted to connect those people to this huge rig that would drill around for the next 15 years. So we mounted a GPS unit to it so it was trackable by every single donor. And then it tweets. We gave it a Twitter account. So every single time it drills, it tweets its location. Total transparency on a, on a machine thousands of miles away. So in six years, we've now raised 74 million bucks through 350,000 donors. It's not about the money, it's about what we can do with it. And we've helped almost 3 million people get clean water. Uh, we've had incredible growth, almost 100% year over year. And giving in America, it's been a really tough time over those years. It's actually been down. People are giving less and less. Right now, there are over 1,000 people working on charity water projects in 20 countries. Locals, 370 people in Ethiopia. 6,600 villages will have clean water for the first time because of the generosity of our donors, of our fundraisers. Last year, we gave 700,000 people clean water. It's 2,000 people a day, one person every 42 seconds. And you guys hear about all these negative statistics, and we think it's time to start taking back these statistics. Talk about people being helped, people being fed, people getting clean water. As we look ahead, uh, we have huge goals. And we said, now we think we've proved the model. How can we go to scale? We want to help 100 million people in the next 10 years. Now, this is a crazy number. We're going to have to raise $3 billion to do it, $30 a person. And we know that people are going to say, it can't be done. But they've said that for the last six years. They said the 100% model couldn't be done. They said no organization could, could scale online like we've been able to. So we're going for it. If you guys are wondering how you can get involved, we'd love your help. Some of you are representing companies. You can get your company involved. Uh, people give up holiday parties. They get employees to give up birthdays. Some just write checks and sponsor water projects. Email me directly. If you're interested in that, I'm just scott at charitywater.org. And then, of course, there's one thing everyone in the room could do, which is give up your next birthday and say, I don't need a tie, I don't need a handbag, I don't need to throw a party. Just give up your birthday, ask people to support you with your age and dollars, and then you and your community get to see where 100% of that money goes. You can learn more about that and pledge at charitywater.org slash birthdays. I'll leave you guys with one of uh, our team's favorite quotes. As we think about the urgency of what we're doing and, and the big goals, it was a, a Jewish rabbi, a guy called Hillel, said, if not us, then who? And if not now, when? So thank you guys for, for listening and maybe for your help.